The second stage involves tunnelling some wires or some extension leads from the head to the, the chest and connecting them up to one of these batteries uh, which you, you saw and we, we typically put that over the pectoral muscle in the chest and it's usually reasonably well tolerated. So in the end you have the final system as you can see here, I'm sure you've seen this, this uh, picture before um, with the two electrodes in the brain and the wires coming out and going down the neck and connected up to one of these batteries and as Richard pointed out there have been significant developments um, uh, over the past few years and uh, there's now uh, the availability of these rechargeable devices um, and they should be available certainly for private patients early um, next year and I think they're already actually available for public patients through the public hospital system. So the rechargeable batteries for some patients will represent a significant advance. So what are the latest uh, sort of changes, advances that we're, that we're seeing? Well, I've just talked about rechargeable batteries and with that comes smaller batteries. So these aren't as obvious, they're not potentially uncomfortable and uh, you know, the smaller the better to some degree. The other big thing from, from a patient's point of view is the fact that we've got these stretchable leads. See, one of the problems before was with these wires that come down the neck to the chest, they weren't really stretchable and they would often pull a little bit when you turned your head and you might notice them there. Some people wouldn't, but some people it would annoy them. And so what we've now got are these stretchable leads and because they do stretch when you move your head and your neck, they don't tend to pull as much and they're really not as noticeable and the patients that I've put those in recently um, have all come back and, and, and really been much less aware of these wires in their neck than the patients that went before them. So I think that is a significant development. How big are the um, electrodes? Well, you'll remember the scan that I showed you before of the thalamotomy and how big that was. Well, you can see here these electrodes are tiny. See there? And so you, you, you're putting smaller wires in the brain. You, you're not potentially disrupting as much tissue on the way down there. Um, and if you put them in the right spot, they do their they do their job and this is what it looks like on the post-operative uh, scans and you, you can see they're quite small. So in terms of the type of tremor that we would be looking for, we stop the medications before the surgery, often um, don't have any medications on the same day as the surgery because we want to see a tremor, we want to see these signs. Um, it helps us to figure out where to put the electrode. So that's the sort of thing that we're after. And during the surgery, now this is turned on and stimulating and you'll see the tremor has certainly disappeared. It's quite quite good. So that's the sort of response that we're after. I'll show you another. This gentleman had quite a severe tremor and this was quite a, a handwriting tremor. So you can see him trying to write there. This is all pre-operatively and you can see really as soon as that uh, end of the pen hits the paper, it's out of control. This is him during the surgery trying to write without any stimulation. So we've put the wires in but we haven't started stimulating. You can see how he's trying to sign his name there and it's very, very difficult. Now we've got him to try to draw those little circles and you can see again how, how bad that tremor is and, and it's quite apparent in, in what's drawn there. So now we turn it on and now you can see all of a sudden his signature, if you can imagine reversing that in your own mind, his signature, you can almost read his name. And then he does the um, uh, circles. So this is the sort of thing that we do intraoperatively. We turn it on, we turn it off, we move it around and it, it it, it's almost like a game, but it's very, very serious because what we're trying to do is to achieve the best result. And this is a functional result. This is important. I mean, this gentleman, you know, couldn't, couldn't go to the, the bank and uh, sign, sign his name to anything. You know, those sorts of things. Important things that we all, the rest of us take for granted that, uh, that we try to improve with, with uh, surgery. So 
going back to the uh, current slide, so what are the results of uh, subthalamic nucleus deep brain stimulation? Well, over 50% um, uh, uh, of patients certainly get improved motor function, and that's, uh, that, that motor function improvements quite a lot usually. Activities of daily living, being able to look after yourself and that sort of thing, they tend to improve. Tremor responds very well. The slowness and the stiffness also respond well, but the tremor does respond a bit better on average, and the, the painful dystonias um, are also reduced. In terms of medication reduction, because this is obviously an important point, the average medication reduction is somewhere between 30 and 70 percent, and about 20, 25 percent of my patients would end up going off their medications altogether, but a realistic goal is not getting off the medications. A realistic goal is reducing the medications significantly. With that medication reduction comes the reduction in dyskinesias, the reduction in those wriggles. Patients tend to spend more time in their on state, and as Richard said, surgery tends to give you the same result as you'll get with your medications when your medications are working as well as they do, okay? So you're gonna get that type of um, result, but it's gonna persist for a longer time of the day, a longer portion of the day on average. So you end up spending less time in the off periods, and the off periods are generally less severe. And the key thing in terms of patient selection, or one of the key things, is that with subthalamic nucleus deep brain stimulation, the patients that tend to do the best are the patients that had a good initial response to levodopa. And sometimes if we're not sure, we'll do the levodopa challenge to, to see whether there's any um, uh, improvement there. So that will often help our selection process. So what are the limitations? Well, I talked a little bit before about some of the limitations of surgery in terms of depression and, and cognitive function and speech. Um, handwriting often doesn't improve. Now, the exception is when the handwriting is due to the tremor, okay? And if the handwriting is due to the tremor and we make the tremor better, then sure, the handwriting should improve. In terms of the walking or the gait, again, if the gait improves with your levodopa type medications, then surgery should improve the walking. But if, you, if that aspect of your symptoms isn't improved by levodopa, then I wouldn't expect it really to improve with surgery. So I won't go through this in too much detail. Richard's already talked about the thalamus as being a really good target for tremor surgery. The globus pallidus internus, I've talked a little bit about that. And again, that's, that's not used as commonly in Parkinson's disease. We use that for other conditions such as dystonia as the preferred target, but certainly for Parkinson's disease, we don't use that as, as much. So in conclusion, I would say that deep brain stimulation is certainly now an established technique. When patients used to come in and they say, look, this is a, all sounds a bit experimental, I'm a guinea pig, well, no, you're not a guinea pig, not anymore. Um, this is now established, um, the, the, this is not a, a new or novel therapy, uh, this, is, this is cutting edge, state of the art treatment, but it does have good evidence to support its uh, widespread use. It is generally safe. The chance of having a significant complication is very small. 95% of people have their surgery and don't have complications. 2 or 3% might have a minor complication and 1 or 2% might be at risk of having a major complication, but the vast majority come through it okay. The benefit does tend to persist and there's data now out to 5 to 8 years showing that the benefit from surgery is still there at that time. Surgery doesn't arrest the progress of the condition, it certainly doesn't, and we do need something that is going to do that and that's going to come from the the, the, the doctors and the researchers in the laboratories, they'll, they'll be the ones that will come up with something eventually. But what we're trying to do in the meantime is provide a, an overall benefit in terms of symptoms, in terms of function, and in terms of quality of life. Again, I'd reiterate the point that surgery should be considered earlier rather than later. And, and the key points in um, determining uh, who has surgery and uh, who decides to have surgery is good patient selection, realistic expectations, and that's, that's very important that patients and their families have realistic expectations. This is a team um, uh, effort. This is not one person doing this operation. There's a whole team. There's myself, there's Dr. Peppard, there's uh, the whole team, the, um, everyone from Medtronic. Um, we have a lot of people in the operating theatre. Anyone who's been in to theatre and had one of these procedures will know it's like a train station in there. There's so many people. And we need a lot of people around because everyone has a specific job to do. And it's important that these techniques are done by groups that do a lot of them 
and that have done the appropriate training and had experience doing that. And that they're the sorts of things that you need to ask the people that you go and see before you let them do this kind of thing on you.